looks like it's stabilized. We're back. Uh, you got the MUX team, Dunbar and Gene. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing? Uh, super excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks for having thanks us. For yeah, anytime, anytime. I'd say we released a released an article maybe a, a week or so ago now. Um, really, really good response. I think a lot of people are really um, we got a lot we, we tend to get a lot of questions from the ones the articles that are quite engaging, particularly in Discord. And um, we've seen a lot of uh, you know, when someone's had a good trade, they they're, they're posting that in there to try and get some clout in the Discord and things like that. Some people have been doing really, really well actually. Um, I haven't personally. <laughs> I've been getting completely destroyed by the market <laughs> in the chop at the minute. But um, I suppose we'll get get into it completely. Um, what we what we like to do just before we kind of get into the product and and what you guys are building and things like that is um, just to get a bit of context. Um, we like to kind of get some get some origin stories on, on both of you guys of how you kind of came into the space and uh, what your current roles are at MUX. So maybe Dunbird, if we, if we can start with you, what was, what was, what was the path into this space? Um, what did that look like? Is there a traditional path into this space? I don't think there is. Um, just, and then uh, we'll uh, move on to Gene. Yeah, totally. So um, yeah, I'm the uh, currently the product contributor at Mux. So originally, I came from a designer background. So I, I studied uh, design in university, and then kind of um, like started working as a product designer in, uh, in 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 agencies. And I worked on kind of several like CRM products before. And it was like during 2020, kind of uh, just like step into the wormhole of crypto <laughs> and actually got interested. So uh, I went to a couple of conferences with some of my friends that were already in this field. So they actually kind of got introduced me to um, the uh, contributors at Mux um, at the time. So kind of had good discussion and uh, eventually kind of looked at me in. And uh, <laughs> so uh, like got here. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a pretty kind of product focus and uh, without much kind of that background at, at the beginning, but now kind of like just learn more about this whole like industry and also kind of try to put my kind of user experience kind of perspective on the, the, the training product. So nice, nice. What about, what about yourself, Jean? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, like st- start to get involved in the crypto space back in 2019. And at that time we were like, we, we, we were still like building the, in the decentral, uh, decentralized perpetual swap space, but we have another, another brand name. Um, yeah, so personally, I, I, I'm, my background is like, um, I study the finance. I used to be involved in the fintech and personally kind of trading crypto for like, for a couple of years. And so at that time, like when I met the other contributors that they are thinking about like how promising the DeFi is, because I still remember at that time, uh, for DeFi, there is only Uniswap and MakerDAO, like mm-hmm. at that time. So uh, we uh, we kind of like um, realized like how like how the BMAX works, and we are kind of like just like the simple idea is to build a decentralized version of the BMAX. And yeah, that's the, that's when we started to ship. We started to build and ship, build and ship, and then we we like along this way, uh, we finally like got into the Max protocol and we have like the aggregator of the purpose. So right now I'm taking I'm mailing taking care of the marketing and operation side for Max aggregator. And uh yeah, super it's a wild journey. Yeah, it's a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um there's never never a dull day in this space. I mean, particularly what what's the day today? It's the it's the fourth of April. So if anyone's listening back to this a couple of days later, it's um there's a lot of stuff happening in the news, a lot of kind of controversy and things like that. So it's it's difficult to kind of um, what's the word? It's difficult to kind of forget all the noise that's happening and just continue kind of focusing on the product and things like that. So um, I don't know what um what each of your roles like compared to kind of previous industries that you may have worked in or kind of studied in even. Um, is it is it a big is it a big shake up? Is it a, like a learning on the job experience? Because I know a lot of people, particularly kind of product and particularly marketing kind of focus. I always try and tap into like their learnings and their understanding of the space because I'm I'm obviously just trying to learn from from everyone who works in the space as well. It's like is there a bit is there a big difference? Obviously, there's a lot of different tool sets um, from what you can and can't use in in the crypto space compared to kind of traditional avenues. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe we'll start with Dunbird and then get on to Gene. Yeah, for sure. 
Like to me, um, I think the space comparing to kind of other industries, like maybe it's like traditional finance com comparing to like different decentralized finance. Like uh, first thing I feel like the, I mean, it's kind of like the <laughs> the bad part is like, it's kind of hard to onboard into this space because there's like so many different terminologies that the like new users or new kind of commerce need to know. And also kind of learn how those like protocols, like different kind of, uh, like mechanisms works. So it kind of takes like a couple months just to kind of get used to it. And like, and during this process, there's a, a lot of buzz about like different tokens, like skyrocket and giving all those pressure. <laughs> so that's <laughs> another side effect, which is pretty bad, <laughs> kind of mess with your mind. But kind of after this, like you kind of onboard into this space and kind of knows what everyone's talking about and uh, kind of understand how like things kind of works. Then I think this space, like just having so much more kind of like creativity and also kind of like bigger stage for people to kind of play this part in because um, it's constantly evolving. Like even like for the perp space, for example, like if you, if you like just like um, like see the, the protocols that are super active at this exact moment and comparing to like the, the space one year ago, it's like like two different like things, right? Like yeah. the other book decks were a huge thing. Now the JMX type of style, like MM is like just, taking the absolute lead <laughs> so it was like um a lot of like people like with like creativity and also kind of knows i mean and who are interested to just learn and explore like there's like a, a big stage for them so. mm -hmm. well what about yourself do you think there's any kind of immediate differences kind of hurdles working in this space as opposed to kind of other industries or what are the kind of benefits or the kind of clawbacks yeah, yeah. like we, we we first yeah totally uh because for, for me like my background is more about like marketing so um i used to do a lot of marketing in the web 2 uh, industry so when i stepped into the web 3 i found it's totally different <laughs> because you know you know like um in web 2 like there is usually a mature methodology to deal with how to do the marketing and how mm -hmm. to do the branding uh, etc but for the web, web 3 because we are still in very initial stage that there is no like mature methodology especially like for different projects they are dealing with different like users different stakeholders so uh, they need to figure out their own way to kind of open the market um to do the so-called cold start so like i think um that is one thing is totally different but because you, this is in this like new area like just need to um to like test and try test and try for for many times and to as fast as possible so that you can like gain some like knowledge and gain some like uh, experiences based on what you did and to figure out an effect, effective way to kind of like building the branding awareness. And another thing is, is also like totally different is that like uh, it's, it's, it's hard to target your target user because <laughs> most of them, yeah, if it's like you, the users here like on web on, on chain, they're like anon. So it's like, <laughs> It's not like in Web two. You have like you have their email, you have their like phone number, etc. You have easy way to approach them. But for Web three, they are totally like in, invisible in the Web three world. So that is also something like what we are dealing with user adoption is so hard. Um, so you need to like figure out like other like kind of like um, sub ways, uh, indirect ways to approach them to kind of like uh, to figure out how to do the user adoption. But yeah, so I think that's like totally new, uh, novel like area, uh, in the perspective of marketing. Yeah, Which yeah, is that's that's <laughs> that's really interesting. I'm I'm glad you said that because um I'm the kind of person who likes just likes to A B test everything, um like test like in a really live and environment. I think a lot of people try to over over plan in in this space, but the space moves so quickly. Um, by the time you kind of put your kind of thesis to the test, if you've been planning for so long the next kind of meta or the next kind of innovations or the next kind of strategy or marketing campaign, like idea that's actually working is kind of came and gone. You know what I mean? So it's, um, mm -hmm. it is a tricky one, particularly I completely agree with what you're saying as well is you don't necessarily have those traditional web to kind of demographics to go off and like target around that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's a really interesting one, but I suppose it's kind of a blank canvas for people who are in that aspect of the industry to kind of carve out themselves. Yeah, for sure. So we've we've done a little bit of background on, on both of you there. So what 
I don't know who wants to pick this up, but who, what's the kind of origin story around Mux or MUX, which which is correct, by the way, which which one am I supposed to be pronouncing correctly? And what's what's the kind of origin story around the product in and of itself? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we usually pronounce this as a Mux because uh, Mux is actually a short version of multiplexing, uh, which is the word in telecommunication. Telecommun yeah. So That's yeah, the max protocol. Yeah, will be good. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I will I will go first and have my my add later. So um, actually, uh, Max is kind of like a rebranding, a rebrand name from uh, our previous protocol. We call it like an MCDEX. So um, MCDEX, as I mentioned, that we have been in the space for uh, since since two thousand nineteen. So it's been a while. At that time, I think. Um, DeFi is pretty, pretty, pretty new yet. So um, the uh, original idea is actually uh, to uh, to 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 uh, to have like a dip into the uh, decentralized perpetual swap uh, space because we believe like the derivative space is like much much larger than the spot market. So uh, we think this is a big cake uh, and uh, it's a good business. So that's the kind of like the. Um, the original idea that we want to build the decentralized version of the BMAX as mentioned. And uh, so like we have been like doing MCDX like from V1 to uh, V4, if I remember correctly, that we have been like iterate the product for several times to better uh, figure out the product product to pro product market fit. And uh, so I think back in last year that we uh, kind of uh, kind of um, find that like the um, the the uh, kind of have like a novel way of like to do that, which we gain some like ins insight and from the uh, GMX model, and so that's when we kind of like uh, start to uh, launch the uh, Max protocol. And after a short while that we realized like uh, liquidity is kind of the thing that kind of um, block us from growing. So we start to do the aggregator to, uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, I started to do aggregator so that we can like provide the, uh, uh, the consolidated services, trading experiences to users that uh, although we don't have the enough liquidity yet, but we can uh, still offer them the streamlined user experiences. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I don't know, Don have you got anything else to, to add there? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think Jin pretty much covered everything. Uh, well, just like a couple of things to add it is, um, yeah. So the team, sorry, the contributors did kind of uh, test it like different AMM approaches, like it, and including order books, like in order books in the in the past, <laughs> to see what's kind of the best kind of approach to handle a perp dex, and uh, yeah, so Max was the fourth iteration. So um, and eventually kind of having product, oh, sorry, proper uh, adoption like along the way. So yeah, and I think it is all about like the key that we found, like key lesson that we learned during this like uh, journey was uh, just to identify the the actual user need. So with the latest model that's uh, kind of originated from JMX, which is like the, the MM where the user can just open, execute any trade allowed by the pool with zero price impact. That's kind of like the game changer there because um, like for all those like bigger traders, um, when they execute bigger trades on even on centralized exchanges, the so slippage and price, price impact can become a thing that cost them like the, the trading cost to be like higher than expected. But then with this new model, like um, it kind of, um, resolve one of the biggest pain points and actually gave traders a reason to trade on chain. So um, we kind of like started from there and then um, identified a lot of room for improvements like um, the, uh, the liquidity multiplexing that Jay mentioned. And also we also did the universal liquidity mechanism, which is uh, unifying all the liquidity across different deploy networks to kind of uh, provide a unified experiences for all the traders. As well as like the we kind of yeah the aggregator idea kind of came up along the way as well to to further address the liquidity issue. So yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of kind of different like uh, experiments and uh, and try to kind of find the the best kind of product market fit. Yeah. Nice, nice. So um, so there might be some people who are still kind of unaware, or you might have some new market participants that are just kind of fresh in in the whole DeFi space. So I don't know if anyone wants to give kind of a high level 
of what the product is. I know we've kind of touched upon it there, but just to kind of solidify what Mux protocol is, um, I think that'd be great for the for the listener or watcher. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Mux itself, it is currently a protocol suite um, that uh, contains two separate protocols. The first one is the Mux leverage trading protocol. And the second one is uh, the Mux leverage trading aggregator, which is two set of contracts that's di- displayed on the on the same front end. So for the uh, Mux trading protocol, leverage trading protocol itself, it is a uh, yeah, per protocol that allows traders to open positions against the its native pool called the Mux LP pool. And traders can open positions with up to 100x leverage with 0% price impact on all the pairs, as well as 0% spread on Ethereum and Bitcoin. And the liquidity pool depth is currently um, around uh, $19 million. So it can handle like, um, yeah, relatively kind of medium to high, like, sorry, medium to large size, um, like uh, positions. And for the uh, leverage trading aggregator, it is a protocol that uh, in- currently integrated with uh, GAINS, GMX, and also soon Synthetics Perp version two. Um, it is a uh, aggregator that will help uh, Perp traders to find the best on-chain um, like trading rules. So this this part of the protocol will uh, dynamically um, route traders' positions based on the market position size, uh, composite trading costs, and uh, trade sorry, and uh, user preferences. So and everything kind of combined together. The goal is kind of to provide users the best possible on-chain trading experiences as well as the lowest possible trading cost. Yeah, nice. Uh, Jane, is there anything you'd like to add there? I think it was a great, <laughs> great summary. Yeah, to be fair. it's very detailed. I just want to quickly add that, like, uh, just left for a no-brainer. You can imagine us as a one inch of the perpetual swaps. So we are kind of like aiming to become the one-stop access for the perpetual swaps. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, I, I'm kind of running around in the far corners of different DeFi protocols near enough every day. And um, for me, just uh, any swap that I, I tend to use, even if it's spot, goes through an aggregator, um, just for peace of mind that I'm getting the best price. Sometimes with like the MEV protection that's built into some of these as well. Um, that's just, I very, very rarely, uh, unless it's, required go directly to the decks anymore um and as i say that's for a couple of reasons purely on wanting best price um trying to get some mev protection in, in there as well so i think it's kind of what we've seen in the in the spot marketplace with the likes of your one inch matcha cow swap and all those kind of things it just feels like a natural progression particularly of how many perpetual protocols are coming on online now and how many gmx forks and all, all the rest of it that are coming on chain, it, it just feels like a natural progression. I don't know if you guys see that too, or, the, or think of like the aggregator being the kind of the mainstay as opposed to going directly to these specific protocols. Okay, I'll go first. Oh, yeah, no, right. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that's exactly the observations that we have uh, before we decided to go for the aggregator because one of which is that like uh because of those like gmx fours and other like perpetual protocols they're like uh lying on different chains so the liquidity of their perps are actually fragmented on different protocols and different chains so that is like kind of a waste of the liquidity so that is one of the reasons that we decided to kind of aggregate the, the liquidity and the second ob- observation that we have like is that because of like uh, for the cost of the perps is pretty complicated. It's not long, not it's not only the uh, transaction fee, but uh, it's not a trading fee, but also the um, slippage, even the margin uh, liquidity, uh, liquid, liquidation price, etc. So it will be hard for the traders to identify the right trading value, if, to trading venue, uh, because there are so many protocols lying there. So basically, these two observations is that what we have. Um, then we decided to go for the aggregator to solve this kind of two uh, two problems that we have in the perp space. Yeah, totally. I think at the moment that the uh, like it was the the development of the aggregator started in uh, like 
in November of 2022. And at that time, there was already kind of 20 different perp DEXs across different networks. Now it's like even, even more, right? <laughs> so uh, with like users, like uh, having a, a, like a product that can offer kind of like a unified liquidity for them, as well as like a guaranteed lowest possible kind of trading cost for them. It's definitely kind of, uh, we saw like what the, what the on-chain traders might need. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense co completely. Um, so what I'll I'll bring up I'll bring up the uh I'll bring up the protocol in a second, but what does the um the user pro like the user flow look like from uh from a trader's perspective? Let me just see if I can bring this up actually. It might make a bit more sense and we can kind of talk through it. Um so let's say I've kind of landed on the landing page. I've got like this I've got the ETH chart up at the minute. So if I was to kind of route a trade through now, um mm -hmm. What, where, where, how do I know where that's rooting from? Do I really need to? Is it, you know, is it going through you guys directly? Is it getting aggregated across GMX or, or gains? Like, uh, what, what's the kind of user pro, uh, process look like here? For sure. So, if you see, like, on the, uh, like, see the market price on the top right corner, there's a little label there, um, like the little Mux logo. So, this is telling you this position is currently going to, if you open it, it will go to Mux at this moment. So how Mux determine like which uh, underlying protocol this position will go? It, it following kind of this waterfall style kind of uh, type of uh, um, like verification. Like first of all is what markets you're 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 selecting. So for a uh, ETH um, position, is is available on both Mux, GMX, and Gains. So all those uh, three protocols can potential can potentially be your underlying protocol. But then it comes to like, what's your position size? So currently you are entering, and then it's like, what will be the trading cost of it? So with the size as it's currently can be uh, allowed by uh, Mox, because Mox kind of for East and BC pairs is offers the best trading cost among all three uh, leverage trading, all, all the three integrated protocols. So it has like 0.08% um, open and close fees comparing to like GMX is 0.1% and uh, gains is also 0.08%. 0 and then it comes to the price impact. So Max offers 0% zero press, zero percent price impact, GMX also 0%, but gains do have um, like press impact. So with all those factors combined, Max are already kind of the, the best um, destination for your ease position. So at this moment, you will say it will go to um, Max. But now if you go to maybe change your uh, market, like from East to, um, let's say to Doge, <laughs> pretty popular at this moment. So yeah, it's like <laughs> Doge. Yeah. <laughs> and now you can see, yeah, because um, the Doge market is only available on gains and not on Mux or GMX. So now when you open this position, it will go to gains. Yeah, that makes, a, that makes an awful lot of sense. And um, let's say if it was, I don't know, um, Something I think GMX have got AVAX, haven't they? Yeah, so uni let's say or that, link. Yeah. yeah, so let's say um I don't know. If we used link and it was like a so if if my size was to increase to say like so that, that that's a good that's a that's a good tell there. So what we're looking at for people who are just listen, maybe on Spotify, there's a if I'm kind of preempting a hundred grand position in in link when i've got 100k size in there it looks like it's going to root through gains if i was to add like an order of magnitude higher um then it looks like it switches directly to to gmx so um and that's just is that just based on a, a liquidity issue is that is that just based on like what liquidity is available for that particular position if i was to go and like hit um obviously i'm not going to do it live on a million dollar link position but um is, is that what's going on in the back end there yeah, totally. It's kind of uh, tell. It's kind of kind of seeing. Okay, now like when your position is like over, let's start here. Clad oh, is the site. Yeah, it's like too large. Then uh, currently only GMX liquidity can handle this position for you. So yeah, this position will go to GMX. So yeah, currently for context, the aggregator will um like route your entire position to a single underlying protocol. So currently it won't con kind of contain two different liquidity sources for a single position. So it's kind of in this style, but in this few in the future, if um, if the traders do have needs to open like much larger positions that even the single protocol can like take it, maybe there will be kind of more of an aggregated like a single position in the future. Yeah, mm, that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Um, and obviously we've got limit and stop 
um, limit orders. What's what's the kind of precondition in there for so that it says this stock market's not available because it's open on G, GMX? So is that just based on if if the order is going to route through GMX or gains or or on MUX itself? It's just based on the ca capability of the underlying protocol. Is that correct? Yeah, it's based on the uh, capability of the underlying protocol. So if you do try to open maybe an ARP position that's only that's only available on MUX at this moment, stock market is available. So because um, like, um, like perp dexes comparing to stop stop dexes, sorry, spot spot dexes. Like there are too many different nuances, like on like the mechanisms, right? The the order type, the different kind of all those like uh, metrics and factors involved. So inter like uh, having a uh, perp uh, aggregator is actually kind of slightly harder than comparing to having a spot aggregator. So when we integrate with the uh, the underlying protocols. We kind of need to kind of check if we need to. We can do that on the contract level or on the front end level on certain parts, and we can offer or and we can or cannot offer offer certain features for the underlying protocol. Like smart, the stock market one was an example that's currently not available for uh, GMX positions, but they are available for uh, Max positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. You know, it is it is very slick, and as I say, a lot of the kind of members in the blockmates Discord. Um, which is available for anyone, by the way, if you're listening, it should be in the description. But everyone's been posting their, <laughs> their winning trades. No one's posting their uh, their losing trades, funnily enough. But that's <laughs> I suppose that's just how it works. <laughs> so what's um I'm holy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so if I if I'm if I head to the I'll just talk to people who are listening to this. If I've headed to the liquidity page on 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 Mux, what what am I looking at here? What's what's happening if I was to deploy and what's the MUX LP and can you just kind of talk us through this and I can just kind of flick through the UI on this, on this part. For sure. So yeah, a little bit of context on this is like Mux aggregator aggregates with Mux the Mux leverage cheating protocol, which has its native pool and also GMX and gains. So uh, all the information on this page is about the Mux native pool. Um, so yeah, so and the mux so users can supply liquidity with uh, allowed put assets and to uh, obtain the mux LP tokens as kind of the yeah this is the LP token and then user can stake this token to earn um, the yield which is which comes from weekly protocol income in Ethereum as well as additional uh, mux which is a reward token uh, rewards. So on this page, on the very top, it's kind of overview. So the, the card on the left is kind of the uh, some uh, like high level information about the pool itself, uh, what's the current stake APR. And if you hover on the number, there's actually kind of a more detailed breakdown of uh, what it is. Yeah. So it kind of tells that's, you what's the... That's really, yeah. that's really good as well. For anyone who's listening, it's, it's really, really good. <laughs> I think it has been like more than 50% for, uh, for almost one month now. Yeah, and it's yeah. The, the beauty of it as well is a lot of protocols will they'll boast a, a really nice APR, but the lion's share of that APR will be coming from the native token, which is obviously not great if you're kind of long term holder. But this this kind of current and projected APR is is kind of th what's what's that fifty two percent current projected uh, in ETH or sixty four percent projected in ETH, and then there's a MUX APR to kind of boost on top of that of 13%. So um, if anyone's looking, yeah. he likes that kind of thing. Just go and take a look. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, then it also tells like the, the price of the, each uh, LP token. Like that is kind of like the, the net asset value. And then also there's a supply info. And uh, as you scroll down, yeah, each of then this is the, uh, as I mentioned, like there the pool that has a portfolio. So the Max LP pool do hold a bucket of um, different volatile assets and as well as stable coins. So it's like a 50, 50, 50 kind of distrib like distribution. So in this case, kind of indicates um, each of the assets that the pool holds as well as the uh, the current value and the, the actual weight and as well as the target weight. Yeah, and uh, what's, what's interesting as well for those kind of, for those assets as well, like on the top of each card, like ETH, BEC, ARB, um, AVAX, and things like that. It's so the indication of different chains. How, how does this play into it? Is is the liquidity deposited from separate chains, and is can that be traded from from any kind of source chain to destination chain? Like how how's the kind of multi-chain cross-chain dynamics of that working as well? 
Oh yeah, for sure. So like for the Max LP liquidity, um, like the pool is currently available on five different networks and the users can actually deposit liquidity on any of these networks and they will receive the Max LP tokens in return. And then after receiving that, they can bridge the token to Arbitrum and to stake them. Uh, staking is only available on Arbitrum at this moment, so they can stake it and to earn the protocol income. But the, I think what's unique about Mux is when it comes to how those like liquidity on different networks will be utilized. So Mux do offer this mechanism called universal liquidity, meaning for traders to open position on any of the deployed networks, the liquidity depths that they had at the moment, meaning kind of that determines their uh, open interest cap for long and short of each pair, is universal across all the five networks. And this is actually done through the Mux having a, a like a, a broker module and uh, to monitor all those the liquidity on the different networks. So like say now a trader try to open uh, a position on say on optimism, but optimism may not have enough Ethereum liquidity at that moment. But then the broker will say, okay, now all five chains combined, it does have enough liquidity to support this position. So it will still allow the trader to open that. And after that, if the trader do close the position in profit, so as long as the um, the, the optimism like Ethereum reserve can uh, meet all those profits, then trader will just take that. But if, if say like their Ethereum profit is too large that even this like single chain uh, liquidity can handle it, then the trader will receive like a, a token called Mux Ethereum. It's kind of like a chip token, <laughs> like a redeemable mm -hmm. token where he, him or she can like just bridge that Mux token to uh, the four other networks and then, um, and then they can just claim actual ETH there. So if you click on uh, the nice. redeem yeah, cool. button, yeah, on the navigation bar, that is where the trader can can do that. So with the broker module thing that we mentioned, along with this kind of chip token type of like uh, mechanism, we kind of uh, kind of enable the whole universal liquidity thing. Yeah, yeah, it's effect effectively like a receipt, isn't it? Like so, you can just take the receipt and then it kind of yeah. Cash in, cash in, cash in. Yeah. What? So what did did you guys build this this kind of token redemption model yourself are you using kind of some kind of infrastructure partner there like i don't know is it is it a gelato is it like a multi-chain synapse or something like that or have you just built it yourself uh no currently this is in-house because um when like the max protocol like some of the kind of fundamental things were designed and developed like uh the, inf the on chain infrastructure, like what then really there to support everything. So we ended up just building it, build it like <laughs> ourselves <laughs> as a start. But I think going forward, yeah, we'll, because uh, there are like different priorities. Like uh, back then was like efficiency and like get the product going was like the top priority. But now as we kind of, <laughs> we are kind of maintaining everything and trying to improve, then we kind of slowly shift to kind of using different kind of infrastructures from third party providers. Yeah. Nice. No, that's great. Um, is, is there anything else we haven't covered there? I think that's about it. But on that part, what's so so one one not criticism, but one kind of there's a few questions that came up um with regards to the kind of token dynamics. Um and <laughs> don't get me wrong, I, if you read the article that we released on the website, it makes complete sense. But some people in the space are just they want everything spoon fed to them. So, <laughs> so um, if something's not kind of completely black and white, they're like they get a little bit confused and they don't want to do like the announcer for research. So, can we describe like how MC MCB and VMUX and MUX play into it and just try and give like a high level overview of the of the kind of um, token dynamics of of the protocol as well? For sure. So, I mean, the like high level of, of this, the whole tokenomics is kind of like um, just surrounding how this protocol income is distributed because Mux do share like the protocol income in Ethereum with the governance token holders as well as LP um, stakers like weekly. So if we look at this diagram there, we can kind of may maybe just separate this into the left and right part. So on the left, there's MCB, we Mux and Mux. It's kind of the, like, this is like one part. So this is the governance token side. So MCB is the protocol's main token, which is transferable, and uh, user users can uh, yeah purchase it on like different DEXs. So after receiving them, users can then lock them into Wee Mux. So this locking is kind of similar to like the curve type of like a curve into Wee curve type of locking. So it's a, a more strict, just like um, 
um, the uh, time lock, <laughs> and it's like uh, you won't be able to kind of stop it before the uh, the lock ends. So it's a bit hardcore. <laughs> but uh, after you lock mm-hmm. it, and between like two weeks to four years, you will obtain your VE marks. So VE marks is non transferable and kind of just bound to your wallet. And this is the governance token. Um, of the protocol where you can vote on things as well as more important, you can uh, hold it to earn protocol income. So if you do maybe, oh yeah, it does indicate this on the top right corner. So the VMUX APR is around like, yeah, 58% of the time. And the, um, yeah, more details are in the docs, but the um, the share of the income that VMUX holders will get is kind of based on the protocol own liquidity portion. So as the protocols um, start to kind of gain its own like liquidity kind of holdings share, VMAX token holders will gradually earn more income as well. And then on the right side, there's Max LP. So it's kind of from external liquidity providers when they supply liquidity and stake it, then they will earn uh, their actual protocol income as well. Um, and the Max token is um, the kind of reward token and uh, it's non-transferable and uh, it can be vested into MCB over one year or be locked, just directly locked into VMAX as well. It's kind of the equivalent of like ESJMX in JMX mm-hmm. ecosystem. Yeah. All right, nice. So the so distribution of fees towards VE MUX and MUX LP is is it looks like maybe like a 60 40 split or is 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 it a little bit more dynamic than that i know gmx and glp is like 30 70 split um so what is the is, is that dynamic or is it kind of a fixed split on the revenue share there it's a dynamic share so how the income is distributed so it kind of it's like two layers so on the first layer is 30 70 so the 30 will directly go to the uh, 30% of protocol income will directly go back to the Max LP pool as protocol owned liquidity. So it's a, a part, so mm-hmm. it kind of, the, the mechanism was there to ensure kind of protocol will continue to grow. So eventually even without any external LP can still kind of be there and serve the traders as concept. And the other 30 will be split between Wii Max holders and the Max LP stakers. So within the 70%, um, it kind of depends on the, so um, currently, like you mentioned, it's kind of a 40, 60 in the 70% because the protocol own liquidity ratio is now around 40%. So meaning uh, for the $19 million of the max LP pool, 40% is from the protocol itself. The other 60% is, is from external uh, LP. So so for this case, um, all the 60% part will go to max LP stakers and then the remaining and uh, the protocol own liquidity portion will go to we max holders. Yeah. Nice. No, that's great. It's it's a it's a as you say it's a it's a really nice token dynamic to be fair. And um, as I say, people who are who are, who are listening, maybe just head over to YouTube and even just watch this segment if you can't be bothered to listen to the full thing because it makes a lot of sense and it's a really really nice dynamic. And the 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 rewards actually paid out in ETH are, are really really generous as well. So um, take a look. Um, but yeah, um, how did? Did you guys get subject to the Arbitrum DAO airdrop? And like, how, how are you guys thinking about that at the time of that happening and now? <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Jane, go for this. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you can add later. Yeah, we did have like around like 1.9 million airdrops from the, from the DAO. Yeah, which is like pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I, I think like uh, for us, like our plan is to kind of uh, to utilize this airdrop to to um, uh, to rebate our traders or to incentivize the, our LPs maybe. Uh, we don't have a specific plan yet, but um, yeah, just the general, general idea is that we can like use utilize the airdrop as a kind of an incentive to um, for our stakeholders, mainly are the traders as well as LPs. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I seen you guys pop up on the on the sheet. And I was I was happy to see you guys there because um there's some protocols on there that I didn't think deserved as much as they got, but I was glad to see you guys were on there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know if this is kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but is you know is there any kind of 
will you guys just be watching out for additional perk protocols that are coming on on online and looking for ways to see if there'd be um, ways to integrate there? I know the Vertex guys should be launching on Arbitrum quite soon. We're quite close to that team. Um, and even like a step further down the line, is is there any kind of ideas around maybe having kind of an options aggregator and starting to look like a, a full suite derivatives platform, one-stop shop for derivatives. I don't know if that's kind of, as I say, getting ahead of myself or I don't know if there's any kind of thoughts around that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think my connection was so slightly off. So what's the question surrounding as like the new, like new per, per protocols come to the space? Are like Mux aggregator, can I keep an eye on them and that potentially integrated with more of them? Was that a question? Yeah, yeah, we should kind of get into the point of there's more and more coming on on online, um, and as I was saying, the Vertex kind of protocol seems to be quite a quite a promising one. And I'm just wondering if you guys are just constantly on the lookout for the correct kind of protocols to integrate. Um, what that process actually looks like is that is that kind of down to the team's discretionary or the contributor's disc- disc- discretion and. Um, or does it go to governance? Or and even further down the line, is is there any kind of potential to act as a derivatives kind of aggregator with options and things like that as well? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, currently, um, like the the process is mostly kind of <laughs> Max kind of directly get in touch with uh, contributors from other communities, like those other three protocols, and to discuss to discuss the potential. Uh, part like integration and then like the devs contributors will actually just work on the integration based on the information kind of provided on both sides so it's more of a kind of yeah direct communication between like two communities at the moment and uh for like the kind of the criteria so say the goals that we try to have is in each integration is kind of just allowing mux to kind of expand to different ecosystems and uh, collaborate with those like uh, leading protocols there and uh, to kind of serve traders with the again the best possible liquidity depths and the best possible trading costs on all the deployed networks so that's is kind of the current strategy that is being taken but we started to have kind of more um, discussions with kind of different uh, teams along the way and then like the just dev resources started to become limited and then we kind of came up with the idea maybe working on a potential aggregator adapter where we can just publish it and then uh, other protocols can just develop their part and then just get connected to it. So Mux can become a more composite kind of aggregator in a sense. Still kind of a concept kind of in a nutshell, but yeah, trying to push for that after um, the devs kind of shift uh, some of the, like the, the main prioritize like uh, to do at this moment. And then for, um, I think in terms of aggregator with a, a broader, I think, I don't know, like uh, the broader kind of derivative space, um, on the Mux end, uh, I think in the near future, like perpetuals will be still be the main focus. So might not be able to kind of work on, on options um, like aggregator as far as we know. But uh, again, <laughs> the roadmap is never determined that we are kind of, mm-hmm. we are always open to kind of explore things. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah. I, I, Jane, have you got anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dumber covered pretty much of it. Just one thing that I like, think uh, at, <clears throat> at the end of the day, actually, uh, aggregator is like something that if we can integrate with more protocols, it's actually the more the better. But um, uh, one thing we need to like kind of um, uh, take into consideration is that for now, we, we still like have uh, pretty uh, limited dev uh, resources. So, for from from the perspective of our um, our uh, our eyes, uh, we think that like uh, we are we are more into like integrate with uh, protocols that ha- can add more value uh, to the aggregator for now. For example, if they are kind of have new market that is not live yet on, on the aggregator, on the aggregator, or uh, they can kind of dip more into the. A new ecosystem for uh, etc so yeah so this is something that we are uh considering for now but in the long term as mentioned by Dumbert, we are kind of working on the a- a- adapter so that will save us like a lot of like dev resources so that the protocols can integrate by themselves so i think that's a way in the long term that can work out mm, yeah that makes a lot of sense um so if anyone's kind of 
I know there's a lot of founders that kind of listen to this as well. Is it, where, where's the best kind of place if they were kind of interested to, is it just jump in Discord or message you guys directly? If they were yeah, interested mostly. in uh, Instagram, join. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please join our Discord and open the ticket and uh, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to kind of round things up, um, what's... What should people be kind of on the lookout for in the kind of short to medium term? Is there anything like you guys are kind of excited about or is it just kind of heads down building, trying to get more user acquisition and things like that? Or I don't know if you have any kind of internal thoughts on that. Maybe Dunbird, we can start with you. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, um, for the short term, definitely kind of looking to expand the user base, have more adoption and uh increased trading volume that's kind of the top priority and if we do look at the stats page of uh, max like look on the volume chart like march was actually a pretty good month <laughs> so we had like the like the largest user adoption and uh, volume increase since the uh the launch of a maxer aggregator which is pretty exciting i think it, it mostly thanks to kind of two factors like the market first the market was like be becoming kind of inc increasingly volatile <laughs> lately um there's more movements and also, we uh, we were I think we were the first decentralized exchanges to list the uh, the Arbitrum token uh, per uh, leveraging market, <laughs> so that kind of contributes to that uh, a lot as well. So I think yeah, in the short term, yeah, it was um, yeah increased adoption, and in the long term, we try we really try to have maybe like a flyaway effect of the protocol growth, so more trading volume, then more liquidity, and then more <laughs> more more trading volume, then more liquidity and repeat. So we and uh, we will try to kind of ship needed features and uh, product updates along the way to kind of just um, ensure this goal. And for the really long term, um, as we discussed, there's the protocol owned liquidity on Mux. And the very long term goal is actually to make the protocol owned liquidity just like very sufficient and be able to um, like support all trading needs with even without needing kind of of uh, like external liquidity sources. And at that point, um, the protocol becomes self-sufficient, then yeah, it will, we win a mission become, become this like long and prosper, prosperous like protocol, <laughs> just living on Web3 and then yeah, serve for the traders, that'd be awesome. Nice, so, Jane, have you got any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just quickly add on that, like uh, actually we are right now working on the uh, a new feature that is pretty much related to the LP side because uh, as you may know, like for the uh, for our LPs, they're, they're handling several risks. Uh, one risk is the, uh, the asset value vol volatility and the other risk is the uh, counterparty of the trader's risk. So uh, we are working, we, we realize that and we're working on like something kind of novel uh, for our L for MLP that will kind of uh, have, we will have like two changes for the LP in the future uh, to kind of to change, change the risks for the LP. For example, like one trend will be like lower risk but lower uh lower yield uh for the other for the other change was like relatively higher yield but higher risks to kind of separate the uh to separate the, this uh, the risks and uh and and profit so that to meet the different uh lps needs uh this is something that we're also uh, working on recently we're expecting to um uh, to have them ready maybe in a couple of months. Uh, this is also something we are also quite excited because it's kind of can uh, offer a new kind of like financial uh, uh, instrument to the community, to our communities. Yeah, so would that effectively allow you to add, I don't know, say like longer tail assets, a little bit more kind of volatile assets and just put them in the more kind of higher risk tranche, if that makes sense? Yeah, so yeah, kind of still kind of a lot of things going to like the model still being refined, but yeah, it will be something like that for traders with kind of um, like prefer kind of maybe lower risk exposure and uh, maybe more stable yield Then there's like the, the low risk type of crunch. And then for someone who's like willing to take the risk and for higher yield, then there's like a, another kind of high, higher uh, return, but higher risk like walls. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's awesome. All right. So. Um, just one point on people users who might be wanting to kind of get involved. The refer is the referral system open for everyone? Can can they just quite easily spin up a an account on there and just kind of 
send out the referral maybe they're using backlinks on their articles or mediums or threads and things like that is it is it yeah. a pretty simple pro- sign-up process yeah feel free yeah, it's a simple process. So uh, yeah, if you go on the referral page and then as uh, as a referral tab, then you can directly create a code and and uh, and then just like uh, spam it <laughs> for for everyone to use it. <laughs> and uh, every account can just like <laughs> create like a limited number of code as well. So just like more powers to everyone. <laughs> just to, to do it. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be one of those guys now and say that we we've got a a mux referral in the link if anyone wants to use it <laughs> so if you want to support the channel you can go and use that <laughs> but um yeah guys um thanks very much for your time it's it's been awesome um i'm glad we kind of got into the details of the protocol and the token dynamics and as i said a lot of people like to be spoon fed so i think that was that was a really kind of great um introduction to it and if people want to learn a little bit more um they can head to the blockmates website and read the article that we released quite recently you want to just jump in the the mux discord then i'm pretty sure they'd be happy to have you guys there as i said there's a referral below if you want to use that to start trading um and if you want to show your positive um returns in the blockmates discord you're more than welcome to do that as well but you also have to show your losers but um yeah just thanks again guys i know you guys must be super busy so thanks a lot for coming on and um maybe in a few months time when these new features are out we'll, we, we can do it again sounds awesome. good awesome. Thank thanks you. Yeah, very welcome. And uh, all right, everyone, we'll speak to you next time. Thanks a lot.